Okay, so this is the last video. This is Friday. So hopefully you are all caught up on the reading. Um, and we're starting on page 53 today with Florian. If you recall, um, Florian and Amelia have left the barn. So they're no longer with um, our friends, Joanna and the shoe poet and the little boy and Ava and Ingrid, they've, they've left. Um, and so this is Florian's point of view. Leave, go away. I was annoyed, angry. Why wouldn't she leave? Walking clearly exhausted her. I follow far behind. You don't see me, she said in her broken German. I can't protect you. Maybe I protect you, she said, her face earnest. I don't need protection. Then why you're not taking the road? She kicked at the snow that had turned to ice overnight. Road is much faster. More chance of food. Countryside prettier, but takes longer. You don't want to be seen? She pulled her pink hat farther down over her ears. What I didn't want was to waste time. I turned from her and resumed walking. I heard her speaking Polish, talking to herself. Eventually she would get tired and have to stop. Her weary body wouldn't carry her far. Thoughts of my younger sister pecked at me, and finally I turned. As soon as I stopped, she stopped, lingering to rest against a tree. I reached into my pack and retrieved the Russian soldier's gun. I walked back to her. Take this. If you need to use it, hold it with two hands, and when you pull the trigger, do you understand? Now go away. She nodded, but I was certain she didn't understand. The gun looked huge in her knitted glove. I walked away. Was I crazy? Three steps back was a pole with a Soviet gun following me, a Prussian, carrying enough secrets to blow up the entire kingdom. My, wo my wound cried out, and so did my judgment. If I didn't report to a checkpoint soon, it would all be over. Page 55, Joanna. We trudged along the road, the sky gray and heavy, and I looked up at the clouds. It's going to snow, said Ingrid, sensing my evaluation. You can feel it, I asked. Sometimes, she nodded, adjusting her grip on the rope, tied to the back of the cart. Tell me about them, said Ingrid. The boy and the Polish girl. I have an idea. I want to know if I'm right. It was fascinating that Ingrid could feel what people looked like. She told me she could sense a person's build, demeanor, sometimes even hair color, but it was the internal qualities that came to her first. The girl was fearful, said Ingrid. Her notions were taut and full of panic. Her breathing was pinched, almost panting. The boy was the opposite. His movement was smooth and lithe, like he was accustomed to moving silently. For days he had been moving with shrapnel the size of a bottle cap inside of him. I thought about his wound and I wondered if he still had a fever. What was her name, the frightened girl? asked Ingrid. Amelia. Yes, that matches, said Ingrid. She tripped over a rock in her path and nearly fell. She clung to the rope and scrambled to regain her balance. I set my hand on her shoulder. This trek was difficult, enough for someone with sight. Two weeks ago, amidst mad chaos at a train station, Ingrid became separated from her aunt. The train departed. Ingrid was not on it. She stood alone on the platform for two straight days, shivering, waiting for her aunt to return. The aunt never came back. On the third day, Ingrid asked people for help. They ignored her. Her luggage was stolen. A young girl finally noticed Ingrid and brought her to my attention. Don't feel sorry for me, said Ingrid. I am able to see things, just not the same things you see. So, the girl, she's blonde? Yes. Amelia's fair-haired with braids, blue eyes, and a round face. The young man is fairly tall, his broad shoulders and brown hair that falls in waves. His hair is a bit long. I don't know his name or what city he's from. And his eyes, asked Ingrid. What color are they? I don't remember. Maybe brown? I don't think so. I think they're gray, said Ingrid. Gray? No, people don't really have gray eyes. The thief does, said Ingrid. I turned to her. You, you think he's a thief? Ingrid said nothing. The temperature dropped and the exposed parts of my face began to sting. We had been walking for over six hours. Ava complained incessantly. She hated the trek. She hated the cold. She hated the Russians. She hated the war. The shoe poet had promised that today we would find the manor house he had known. I doubted him and warned that he shouldn't get people's hopes up, especially the little one. The wandering boy's spirits are already so low. 
Ah, but if I am right, said the poet, you will massage my feet by the fire. I wasn't so sure that I wanted to accept that wager. Page 58, Amelia. I busied myself on the walk. I looked at the trees and thought of the big stork's nest that I had seen on top of the barn. It made me think of Mama. I thought of the warm, sunny days when she would take me to pick mushrooms in the forest. In the forest near Loa was a beautiful oak tree with a hollow large enough to sit in. We'd take our baskets to the tree and I'd scramble into the cavity. Mama would sit with her back against the trunk, legs crossed at the ankles beneath her skirt. You love stories, Amelia. While the trees hold hundreds of years of stories, she'd tell me, touching the bark. Think of it. Everything these trees have seen and felt, all of the secrets are inside of them. Do you think the trees remember each and every stork? I'd ask from inside the cool hollow. Of course the trees remember. Like I said, they remember everything. Just as the trees were Mama's favorite, storks were mine. I had them six months of the year. At the end of each summer, the storks would leave and fly to Africa, where they'd live in the warmth along the Nile for the river. In March, they would return to Poland to the nests that they had left. To invite a stork to a nest, families would nail a wagon wheel to the top of a tall pole. We had one in our yard. Every March, we would celebrate when our stork returned to the nest. As August faded, the departure of the storks symbolized summer's end. Six years ago, the day our stork left, Mama left too. She died giving birth to what would have been my younger brother. My throat tightened and I swallowed, reminding myself she wasn't really gone. I felt Mama among the trees. I could feel her touch and hear her laughter in the leaves. So I talked to the trees as I walked, hoping their branches would carry messages up to Mama and let her know what I had done. And most of all, that I would try to be brave. Uh, now we're back to Joanna's point of view. Why would you? Why would we believe a cobbler, lamented Ava. He's a shoemaker, not a prophet. I didn't admit it, but I'd begun to lose hope as well. He had said he knew the area, I told her. He said that when he was young, he traveled by, by the estate with his family. We've been walking too long. If we push much further, the horse will be broken and won't be able to com continue tomorrow. Ava was right. We had spotted a small barn a few kilometers back. Some of the group left to spend the night. We had decided to press on, following the shoe poet and his ambitious walking stick. Only one horse remained. A few days prior, we had two carts and three horses, but some German soldiers we encountered had taken one of the wagons and two horses, claiming they were needed for the war effort. Since I did not ask for our evacuation orders, we didn't argue. The German army had taken everything. Cars, patrol, radios, animals, food. It was clear that they were sinking under the weight of the Allied forces, but Hitler's regional leader, Gauleiter Koch, refused to al allow citizens to evacuate rather than fall into the brutal hands of the Russian raiders. Some, of, some people defied the Reich and left without orders, like us. If Poet's estate did exist, it was sure to be a shell of its former self, stripped and plundered by the German army. Or worse, German soldiers could be staying in the house themselves. They might question us for not having formal evacuation orders. The snow will fall soon, said Ingrid quietly. The poet stopped and thumped his stick against the icy road. Aha! This is it! It was nothing. We were stopped near the same pine forest we'd been trekking alongside for hours. Poet called to the wandering boy and whispered in his ear, pointing into the woods. The boy took off running. We waited, shivering. My dear Ava, if I am right and there is in fact an estate, will you apologize to me? asked the shoe poet. If there's an estate, I'll dance with you, old man, snapped Ava. A close dance, the po shoe poet nodded. A waltz, please? The wandering boy suddenly appeared on the road in front of us. His tiny body bounced up and down with excitement as he waved us forward. He stood amidst a small gap in the trees, revealing a narrow, overgrown drive. Very smart, the noble junkers have concealed their drive, said Poet. Move those large branches away, my boy. We must steer the horse and cart behind these trees. The boy did as instructed. We pushed through the small opening, and the path widened into a larger mouth. Once we were all inside the brush, the shoe poet and the boy replaced the branches. Should we cover our tracks leading to the trees, I asked. Forget about that. The snow will cover our tracks. Hurry, Ava called out. We plodded down the narrow band, the trees soldiering up around us, tall and dark. We arrived at a clearing, and in the distance, perched on a low rise, was an elegant, stately home with long windows and multiple chimneys. 
Well, I'll be damned, whispered Ava. Uh, this is Florian's point of view. And remember now, Florian is not with the group any longer. So he and Amelia are still separated from the group. I paused eating snow for a drink of water, and I pulled out my small notebook, and I took, looked at the map that I had sketched earlier, trying to orient, orient myself. I had to be closer to the coast, didn't I? Once we reached the lagoon, I would cross the ice to the boats on the other side. Should I have stayed with the group from the barn? By walking through the woods, I'd accidentally moved farther from my destination. If so, I might be walking directly toward the Russians. The back of my neck ached. The fever had returned. I pulled the remainder of the sausage from my pocket and prepared to shove it all in my mouth. The Polish girl plopped down in the snow and ate handfuls. I wish she'd leave me alone. But then I thought of my sister. I took out my knife and I cut the sausage in half. I whistled to the girl and tossed a piece of sausage to her. She caught it and smiled. Cupping it in her small gloves, she raised it to her nose before popping it in her mouth. Your home is here? In Prussia, she asked. You speak like expression. The pink in her cheeks matched her hat. I knew where her home was, and I knew what had happened there. Did she know? Yes. East Prussia. Konigsberg, I said. I probably could have told her the truth. I was actually from Tilsit, just north of East Kon I'm sorry. I was actually from Tilsit, just northeast of Konigsberg. I wondered if the Russians had taken their t had taken Tilsit yet, and what would become of East Prussia. It was a former German kingdom perched south of Lithuania and north of Poland on the Baltic Sea. Stalin had already taken Lithuania, and he would take East Prussia too. The girl chewed her gaze at me unbroken. Hail Hitler? she asked quietly. I said nothing. The girl looked up at the sky, and she pointed and started talking about the trees and the stars. I would abandon her tonight. Um, now we're going back to the port with Alfred. So he's the soldier that's on the ship. Anxiety swelled in the harbor with each minute that passed. Rumors circulated that the German front had fallen two weeks ago. Temporarily, I assured my fellow sailors. We were told the Russian forces had restored their medieval military order of rape and pillage, and now the vile Russians were closing in. Refugees, weary souls displaced from their homes, would throng toward the port, desperate to flee the communists. There would be hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of them. The German high command had quickly organized a massive water evacuation. They called it Operation Hannibal, after one of the greatest military strategists in history. An enormous convoy of ships would be dispatched to the west. Ambulance trains loaded with wounded German soldiers barreled toward ports. Goya, Ubina, Robert Ley, Arundi, General von Steuben, Hansa, Pretoria, Caparcona, Deutschland, and Wilhelm Gustlov. Ships all designated for evacuation from various parts. This would be my first ever journey at sea. My maiden voyage had already presented its challenges. I noticed an unbecoming rash had appeared on my hands and in my armpits. I blamed the communists. The sailors speak to, sorry, the sailors continued to speak of evacuation plans, and I sensed that my input was needed. There is not enough time, I remarked to one of my sp superiors, to register and board hundreds of thousands within a matter of days. I don't think it's possible, sir. You will make it possible, was the order. I looked across the dock, imagining the scene. The entire population would be driven to the coast. The ports would be mayhem. German soldiers would have priority, of course. Desperate refugees would be selected, registered, and processed to board ships. Thousands had arrived already in ox-driven carts piled high with their belongings. They were haggard, falling asleep in the snow. I saw a man so hungry he was eating a candle. Please, sailor, help me, they would plead as I walked by. I would do something this time. Maybe. For some. I sang my melodious list of enemies. You go, Slav! And I imagined myself at home in Heidelberg where the war was over. Crowds of women and children would flock around me while I doled out oranges from burlap sacks. Yes, Hanalore, it is dangerous. I've been selected for a very important mission to disinfect this land. But we heroes eat danger atop our porters for breakfast. It is nothing, dear one. Nothing. If the evacuation failed and the ports were bombed, more than half a people, half a million people would die. A thundering boom echoed near the water, and someone screamed, desperate, panicked, strangled with fear. My fingers twitched, 
and a tingle ran up my spine. The Prussian knight walked ahead. He had secrets. I had secrets, too. My legs ached, tired of walking. I missed school. I loved my desk, my teachers, the smell of freshly sharpened pencils waiting patiently in their box. I had arrived at school that day, anxious for the math exam. Mama used to tease me that I was all nature and numbers like my father. As I approached the schoolyard, I saw it. Our desks and chairs were stacked in the back of an open truck, and our textbooks were smoldering in a heap. One of my teachers ran toward me, crying, Hurry, Amelia, go home. They've shut down the school. But why? I asked her, moving closer to the truck. Wait, I have things in my desk. No, run home, Amelia, she sobbed, tears streaming down her face. The Nazis claimed I didn't need an education. Polish schools were closed. Our desks and equipment were taken to Germany. Would a German girl open my desk and find my treasures inside? The Nazis said the people of Poland would become serfs to the Germans. They thought we only needed to count and write our names. My father was part of the Lwow School of Mathematics. He would never agree with children not being taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. They had burned our books in the Polish language, but I had learned to read very young. They could never take that away from me. I continued walking, thinking of food, rest, a soft bed, and a warm blanket. I would settle for hay and a potato. Snow was falling, making everything appear fresh. The white snow covered the dark truth. Pressed, linen, pressed white linen over a scarred table. A crisp, clean sheet over a stained mattress. Nature. That was something the war couldn't take from me either. The Nazis couldn't stop the wind and the snow, and the Russians couldn't take the sun or the stars. I dropped back slightly, and I stepped into the trees, thinking I would feel better if I relieved myself. The night continued walking. I was crouched on my heels when I saw it. A uniformed soldier slipped out of the trees behind the night. He had a gun. He was pointing it. I jumped up and screamed. Bang! This is Florian's point of view of the events that just happened. Bang! I saw the girl first, legs apart, gun drawn, and then I saw the soldier between us writhing on the ground, a bullet torn through the shoulder of his coat. His pistol lifted, but I shot first. The gunshots bounced hollow in my head. I scanned the woods. Were there more? I kicked the pistol away from the soldier and quickly fleeced him of his ammunition, food, papers, and canteen. This was bad. Very bad. What's wrong with you? I whispered to the Polish girl. He was German, not Russian. I look around quickly. Hurry, someone heard those shots. I piled up the supplies. We have to run. Put these in your pocket. I held out the items to the girl. But the girl didn't respond. She stood, cemented in shock, pink gloves on the gun, her body trembling. The Russian pistol fell from her hand and dropped into the snow. So the girl saw this uh, this German soldier coming up behind the knight, as she refers to him, and she shot him dead. Um, it, well, actually, she shot him, but he wasn't dead. The Florian turned around, and the soldier was pointing a gun at Florian. So then Florian, in turn, shot him dead. So now there's a German soldier. There's German blood on Florian and Amelia's hands. Okay. Um, the next chapter is Joanna. We marched up the hill toward the estate. Tonight we would have thick walls, a warm fire, and a solid roof to shield us from the snow. Just as I remember it, said the shoe poet. Extraordinary. We shall walk around back. I expect that's where the kitchen entrance will be. I painted a visual for Ingrid. It's beige sandstone, large, tall windows across the front and upstairs. The entry door sits like in a diamond-shaped alcove. Ingrid clutched my arm. I don't like it, she whispered. What's not to like? It's shelter. Ingrid's nostrils pulled at the surrounding air, but she did not reply. We made our way around the back of the manor house and entered through the snow-covered garden hedge. Poet's feet stopped short. Tall glass doors with shattered panes stood open into the garden, torn damask curtains flapping like a loose tongue in the wind. The courtyard was littered with clothing, broken crockery, shoes, books, and various personal items. A baby carriage lay mangled on its side, dusted with snow. The wandering boy stepped in close. I put my arm around him. Sorry, but what did we expect? Ava laughed. Servants waiting outside in a receiving line? She shrugged and walked inside. Ava was right. Nothing was intact anymore. The entire region was broken, bombed, and looted. How could we have expected anything different? The cold wind blew, banging the crippled doors as we went inside. 
And the main floor of the house was divided into five large rooms with high ceilings, all connected by tall double doors. Standing in what had been the garden library, we could look through the door and see across to the opposite end of the house. Floor to ceiling, shelves lined with library book walls. The books, raped and rummaged of their dignity, lay in heaps on the floor. We stepped over the books and through the doorway. Let's choose a room to sleep in, close off the doors, and start a fire to warm up the space, commanded Ava. She stopped midway through the house. This'll do. Where's the kitchen, I asked. Maybe there's food or a drink. Yes, Ava sighed, a drink. Ava instructed the shoe poet to collect any wood or paper he could find in the, in the fire, for the fireplace. Not the books, please, poet, I whispered. He nodded and patted my arm. We won't disturb their things. I set down my bag and I walked through the house admiring the ravaged, ghostly splendor of each room in its panicked disarray. I reached the end of the main floor, the dining room, as, and saw a small silhouette. The wandering boy stood next to a long dining room table, his head bowed by an overturned chair, and I approached quietly and looked over his shoulder. A basket of mossy bread in the center of the table was crawling with brown mice. Flowered china bowls skinned with half-eaten soup sat on a dusty tablecloth, the spoons still in them. They hadn't even been able to finish their dinner. Um, and now we're back to Florian. We're going to see what he and Ava choose to do with the German soldier that they have just killed. I dragged the dead German into a wooded thicket and covered him with snow. But what if someone found him? I gripped my pistol and searched through the trees for light. Using the scent, as fire, scent of fire as a guide, I walked quickly through the forest. I should have known. It had been too quiet all today. The Polish girl saw the gun and thought he was going to shoot. She thought she was defending me. The girl followed. When I looked to the right, I heard her breathing stop, trying to swallow the tears. My sister, Ani, did the same thing the day father sent her way up north. She did not want to cry. She held her breath in one hand and her suitcase in the other. The memory brought pain to my stitched wound. I still smelled smoke and I hoped it signaled a resting spot. If I couldn't rest, I wouldn't get far tomorrow. We emerged from the woods, the Polish girl pointed. In the distance, a large manor house sat on a frozen loaf of f sat on a loaf of frozen earth. The house was dark, but smoke coughed from one of the center chimneys, grayer than the gray sky. Was it a trap? The frozen meadow leading to the warm house could be a minefield. The girl moved close. I shared her concern. What if the house was nested with Germans or Russians? Either would be a problem. The Russians would kill me or take me hostage. The Germans would demand to know why I wasn't in uniform. I didn't want to imagine what they would do to the girl. We'll follow the tree line until we're closer, I whispered. We'll see who's there. One thing I knew for sure, we would not find a kindly old couple enjoying an evening pipe and needlepoint in the drawing room. And this is Amelia. We walked toward the large house. With each step, I felt increasingly ill. I shot him. I shot a man. The night saved me, and now I had saved the night. But why didn't that make me feel any better? The sound of gunfire had ripped a seam in my mind. Discarded memories were now leaking, dripping through. Boots, screaming, glass shattering, guns firing, skulls against wood. I tried to push them away. Please go away. I couldn't make them stop. The memories rolled at me faster, faster. All the little duckies with their heads in the water, heads in the water. All the little duckies with their heads in the water. Oh, such sweet little duckies. A searing pain tore through my body and I collapsed in the snow. Okay. Um, so I want you just to think for a minute. I'm going to read one more chapter. Um, I'm going to read Joanna and then um, I'm going to stop for the day. But I want you to think for a minute about the manor house. So um, Amelia and Florian are on their own, and Joanna and the shoe poet, and Ava and Ingrid and the little boy are all in a manor house, and Amelia just taught, mentions um, the large house. So we're, our group is going to meet up again, and this is going to be the last time that they separate from one another for a while. They're all going to stay together after this point. Um, so this is the this is where we're going to stop for the day. Um, once they all get back together again. 
So this is Joanna's point of view. The shoe poet sat by the glowing fireplace, polishing his boots with lamp black he had scraped from the hearth. The wandering boy watched intently at his side, mimicking the strokes of his own small ankle boots. The fire cracked and popped, rolling waves of heat in front of my face. Glorious. I wrapped the scarf around my head and I buttoned my coat. If I, can't, if I can find an oak tree, I can boil the bark to treat some of the blisters, I told Poet. I'll come with you, he said. Rest. You need your strength for the days ahead. I'm fit as a lad, my dear girl, and he pulled up the leg of his wool trousers to reveal his bony knee. It was covered in white. Shoemaker's secret, he whispered to the wandering boy. There's mercury in white shoe polish. Fights off the arthritis. Fit as a lad, I am. The wandering boy pulled up his pant leg to inspect his own tiny knee. Poet smiled and patted the boy's head. The old man was still full of energy. He refused to buckle under the burden of grief and loss. Be careful out there, Joanna, he told me. I walked through the darkened shell, back to the library with its smashed glass doors. A book lay open, its pages flipping in the icy wind. I bent to pick it up, and the name on the cover daggered me with guilt. Charles Dickens. Grandma had given the Pickwick papers to both Lena and me for Christmas. Lena, what had I done? I set the book on a table and I walked out to the cold, making my way toward the trees. Two dark figures sat in the snow, halfway between the forest and the estate. I looked closely and saw blonde braids blowing beneath a pink hat. It was the Polish girl and the young man with the shrapnel. I made my way toward them. Were you following us? I called out. Hurry, he shouted. Something has happened to her. I ran. Amelia sat in the snow, her chin dropped to her chest. What's wrong? I asked. She didn't respond. I think she's in shock. She shot a soldier in the woods. She won't move, he said. I knelt beside her. She quickly wrapped her arms around her body, trying to inch away from me. It's okay, Amelia. Tell me what's wrong. Let me help you, I said. Let's go inside. She wouldn't move. Instead, she lay down in the snow and started to unbutton her coat. I helped her with the buttons, and then sifting through her many layers of clothing, I gasped when I saw it. Oh, dear God. And that's where I'm going to stop today. Um, we'll find out what is so wrong with Amelia in a, in the next chapter or two. Um, but you can go ahead and um, if you've finished your questions for the day, then you're done with your assignment for the day. And um, that that's it. If you have any questions, make sure you email me. Otherwise, I hope to see all of you guys back in class on Monday.